This episode is sponsored by Winter Victor Studio. Mesdames et messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed! They've given it everything on the global bucket! Oh, yeah! Oh! Oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello, fans of Shook Lestan, and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello, how are you? Hello. I am realizing how much I miss all the winter sports. <laughs> it got hot, didn't it? It got hot all of a sudden and sticky, at least around me. The bugs are starting to come back. Mm -hmm. The phlegm is starting to increase. <laughs> But I really can't complain because when we were in China, neither one of us could breathe because it was so dry. Ethyl and her menthols <laughs> that I mentioned last week was in full force. So I, I would like to go to visit some curling ice. Yes, I, I would. I would have to agree with you on that. Before we get started with today's show, we have a correction from last week from listener Don, who noted that we, we talked about uh, the Boston bid. Oh, we were talking about bids and who drives them. And he reminded us that the Boston bid was actually conceived by two guys in their 20s unrelated to construction. And that's what, like that light bulb went back on in my head. Two guys said, hey, it would be cool if Boston was in the Olympics. And then the bid ended up being led by a commercial real estate developer. Do you think those two guys were at Dunkin' Donuts or at the bar? Oh, they were probably at Donkeys. <laughs> I get one of those crawlers. <laughs> and none of that iced coffee. Only the girls get the iced coffee. <laughs> oh, Speaking of listener Don, we'd like to thank him and uh, Winter Victor Studio for their support of our show. Winter Victor Studio believes sport and beautiful design go hand in hand and that a designer's versatility is just as important as an athlete's dexterity. Winter Victor provides distinctive graphic design to clients in sport. From logos to digital communications, Winter Victor brings the same passion to design that our clients bring to the field of play. Add a responsive and versatile designer to your team at wintervictor.com. Today, we are delighted to have bobsledder Josh Williamson back on the show. Josh was a winner on the first season of the USOPC's the next Olympic hopeful and was our very first interview. We followed Josh along in his journey from Olympic hopeful to official Olympian. And he made the U.S. bobsled team for Beijing 2022, but barely made it to Beijing because of a positive COVID test. He did get there in time to compete in the four-man competition, and he pushed for driver Hunter Church. The team placed 10th overall in the final standings. We talked with Josh last week about his experiences in Beijing. Take a listen. Josh, welcome back to the States. Welcome back to the show. <laughs> It's good to be back. It's, it's, it's so exciting me. to have you on again. I don't even know where to start with Beijing. Well, I want to start with the Team USA trip to the White House. And that since that just <laughs> happened, it was just this week. Tell us a little bit about that and what that was like. Yeah, of course. I mean, it was really cool. I mean, again, it was obviously, I think, I think it was one of the best parts about it was it was the first time from my understanding that the summer and winter Olympians all went at once. Mm -hmm. when Olympians and Paralympians, it was really cool. It was like the coolest experience ever. We got to meet everybody. I got to meet so many different athletes from so many different sports. It was like on top of all the fun events we did, they had a, a summit the first day, mostly focused on like a job fair because a lot of athletes, if they are transitioning, it's important for them to have those resources, which I guess is a newer thing this past decade, I would say, that they've started implementing, which is really fun because – they had a lot of businesses there that just wanted to, you know, meet you. And if you were interested in any opportunities, even if you were continuing sport, which is where I'm at, I'm going to do another, definitely at least another four years. So for me, that was more what I was looking at. And those, that was just cool options. The next day we did um, an impact day in the morning. We were packing some bags for, I, I can't remember the name of the charity off the top of my head. I wish I could, but they, we were packing bags and sending them out to kids and writing notes, encouraging notes, mostly to do a sport, packing sports equipment and stuff that they would be kind of have free access to which is really cool it was a fun 
kind of part of the day. And then that night we had a gala, which was really fun, but you had to get up pretty early the next morning for the white house. So you had to make sure you weren't having too much fun because we had like a 7 AM bus ride to the white house. So we did that and got over there and that was obviously an amazing experience and went to the airport and flew home. So it went by pretty fast, but it was fun because a lot of my teammates I hadn't seen since the Olympics and some guys are retiring. So a few times this summer we get to see each other might be the last time for a while. So it was nice to catch up again and kind of just get to see everyone. Now, I wasn't sure because you mentioned you were at a wedding. I did see a picture of you and a foreign national all dressed up. And I was wondering, mm-hmm. are, are we now smuggling Canadians <laughs> into these events? No, I, I would have if I could have. I really would have. <laughs> she would have loved it, but I get to bring her to the White House. But it was, uh, she, we were at my friend's uh, wedding in Dallas, Kristen and I. It was a lot of fun. We love going to weddings. My last wedding we got to go to was my cousin's back two years ago, and that was a great time. So we, it was fun to get out there. And it was her first time in Texas. I hadn't been in years. I have some family in Texas. My mom's from Texas, so I have a lot of family out there. And it was just really nice. My grandfather went to seminary in Fort Worth. So we got to see that a little bit. And it's just my grandmother was born in Fort Worth. So it's always fun kind of going back there. But I hadn't been since high school, maybe, you know, so it's fun to show her around a little bit. Now, we're we're going to talk about her a little bit more. And I promise I will give you an out of any question you you, you don't want to answer about Kristen. I promise. But (laughs) I'm pretty open about all that. (laughs) Well, I mean, I figure it was okay since it was posted on Instagram. Yeah, right. (laughs) Okay, so let's go back in time to probably the best moment was when you got named to the team. Cause the last time we talked to you, you had not gotten named to the Olympic right. team yet. So how'd you find out? What was that like? Chris and I actually talked about this and some of my teammates too. It's a really interesting experience because I think from my understanding from guys who have you know, been in the sport before me and athletes who've just done the sport, when that team is named, it's a huge weight lifted off their shoulders, right? It's like this big moment where they just have so many things to look forward to. And it's just really cool moment. But for us, we were in St. Moritz. We were in Switzerland. We just finished the World Cup race. The I want to say it was the, the last race of the year. So generally, sometimes the team gets named and there's a race after that. So it's like the season's not even over yet for some people. But for us, the season was over. So that was nice. And at first, it definitely got me excited. But it was a very weird feeling because it was almost, it almost didn't, you didn't feel secure because I think it mostly due to COVID was kind of what we all agreed upon when we all talked about how that felt. Because at the end of the day, there still were no guarantees. And at that point, we're two and a half weeks out and we're going to fly back to California. We're going to be in California for a bit, we stage in LA, and then we fly over to China. If at any point throughout that process, you test positive, your chances of going start getting really slim, the closer you get to that date that we fly out. So that was, for a lot of us, it was, it's weird. I think Tokyo, the Paralympians and Olympians could probably relate to that as well. The idea that Normally you get named to a team and it's a huge weight lifted off your shoulders. And now this time around, it was like, it almost made it more stressful because now you're thinking, what if I get named to an Olympic team, but don't get to go to an Olympics because I guess positive, (laughs) you know, and I guess that's always the thing with injuries too. It's no different than injuries, but COVID just made it seem different, I guess. And I think we all could relate to that. There was, it was definitely a unique experience for these last two groups of uh, athletes who competed at the games, I think, but no surprise there, I guess. (laughs) So you get to LA, you're being processed, you test positive. Mm-hmm. I was Let- actually staying in Chula Vista at the time. Well, so I guess I, I will explain our, our travel. We drove from Switzerland to, I want to say it was Munich, I think, Munich. And then we fly from Munich to Los Angeles. So that was a long day. We got off the plane in Los Angeles, or San Diego, sorry, San Diego. And then we drive to Chula Vista, which I mean, Chula Vista, if you don't know, is probably 20 minutes from the border of Mexico. Beautiful area. It was my first time at that training center. And that was, it was a beautiful spot. I'd love to go back there if I had, you know, more time, more reason to be over in that part of the country. But it was great. And I mean, the day before we head to LA is when we have to start taking COVID tests. Because at that point, if you're three days out from the Olympics, they're requiring, you know, a 72 hour negative, 48 hour negative. 24 hour negative to get on a flight to China, then you test on the ground. And obviously from there, as you guys, you know, you test every day after that. So we are kind of getting in that process and first test, I get a call that night from one of the team USA staff that's already in China. Cause they're the ones who get the results from the hospital, just informing me that I had tested positive. And for me, that was really sucked. Cause I, I think in a, the next day and a half was when my team was leaving to LA. So obviously I wasn't going to be on that bus. And, uh, 
it was just tough. You know, at the end of the day, I was staying. My first worry was I get the call while I'm in the dorms in Chula Vista. We're staying four to a room. So I'm like, I just get out. As soon as I hear that on my phone without saying anything to the guys, I just leave the room because I'm like, one, I need to get as far away from that as possible if they didn't test positive. It's a little cold that night, so it really sucked because obviously nobody was anticipating this. And I just sat outside for like three hours just waiting. Because I, I, they eventually, I texted them. I said, hey, guys, after I kind of got my thoughts together, I'm like, hey, I tested positive. I don't know what that means next for you guys and for me. But I know for me, I'm probably going to be staying in Chula Vista. So I stayed outside. I guess the USOC got in touch with them. They all had to move out. But nobody really knew. I didn't know that. So I sat outside for like three hours until I finally got to go back in the room. But the room was obviously empty. It was very eerie because I was sleeping. Chris Horn, my teammate, we were in a room and I bet I could I could touch his bed for my bed. So I was dumbfounded that eventually nobody else is positive, which I mean, thank thank God nobody did. But it was really confusing. We were in a in a bubble in Chula Vista. We really weren't leaving the training center for anything. The only people to test positive there were myself, our high performance director and one of our sports med staff that was with us. That was the, I was the only athlete in that bubble to test positive that was. So it was just confusing more than anything. And that was the hardest thing to grapple with, I think, is I felt fine. I tested positive. I really didn't feel too bad. And I just, but I was told I was sick, so I wasn't going to be able to compete. And that was tough. So that's kind of, I guess, how that process started. It was just a long few weeks of me hanging out in California where everybody else went over to China, <laughs> just did, watching them. Did you ever feel sick? I mean, truly, did you ever get COVID? I didn't, I, I could tell, so I, I have allergies and I know a lot of people do. I have seasonal allergies. So I was very confused because for example, one morning I woke up and I had like a scratchy throat and I'm like, oh, Every, again, everybody is on 10 here about if you feel anything. So I was worried. I talked to some staff. I just drank some water and it actually went away. I'm like, okay, I guess that was, I just had a dry throat in the morning. I need to stop being so paranoid. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> did that. And after I tested positive, so often I'd have maybe like a sinus headache or, but really nothing bad. I, it was better than any cold I've ever had. What was interesting was after probably five, six days when I'm technically supposed to be kind of like, I shouldn't be feeling anything, even though I would be testing positive on the test, especially at that higher threshold China had us testing at. I was still hitting positive, but I wasn't feeling obviously anything at that point. They had me take Paxlovid, which is the new antiviral from Pfizer, I want to say. Just the idea was anything we can throw at it to get your CT value as high as possible is what we're going to do. Because at this point, there's flights leaving every two, three days, but after another week or two, there's no more flights. And if and once the last flight goes, that's the last ticket to China. So for us, it was like, what can we throw at it? We did that, and that made me feel horrible. I was so It was crazy because for me, I felt fine when I had COVID, I took that Paxlovid morning and night. It was like three pills in the morning, three at night for five days. It's like it left this like metal taste in your mouth for like four hours. I couldn't stand up without getting like car sick, nauseous. I like, I just felt horrible. It was, and it was, it was really, I guess the hardest part about that was I wasn't supposed to train when I had COVID because they wanted you know, my immune system to, to just worry about fighting it. Don't stress the body outside of resting up. Then when I start taking packs of it, they're saying, okay, you can start training now if you want. Well, I can't, I can't even, you know, I can really stand up without getting nauseous at that point. So I ended up probably having like a, almost a week and a half of no training going into the Olympics, which for me was probably the worst part because you're watching everybody at the Olympic venue, training hard, lifting the heaviest weight they've ever lifted and sprinting and everything's kind of coming together at this peak for them. And for me, I'm taking a week and a half where I'm not allowed to even go run outside <laughs> so it's just yeah, not, it was not, this mental thing right not uh, the way the you want to taper right exactly <laughs> it was just not ideal for that and i tried to keep it in my head you know i'm getting rested i should feel better there it's out of my control at that point but it was just that was the hardest part to grapple with is and obviously watching opening ceremonies wasn't easy because that was when everybody talks about it. when you're going to the olympics that's that's when it hits you that's what every teammate i've ever had told me and now it's like well I'm going to watch it at home, but I, I would like to go to another Olympics. So I still a goal of mine is to experience an opening ceremonies, but that was just the card I was dealt. And at the end of the day, I still got to compete, which is the most important part. I got over there and it was, I think it was as good of an experience as it could have been given the circumstances. And it was definitely a unique one. <laughs> so I guess there's a blessing in that. So I know when I read the Instagram post 
saying you had tested positive, I started crying because I took this so personally. And then we started posting within our Facebook group and everybody was so devastated. And then it became, okay, can we do anything to get Josh better? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I guess we'll all start cheering for his white blood cells. I don't know. Yeah. So I, I hope at least you felt all the support because I know your family was, everybody was pulling for you, but what was USA bobsled communicating and your teammates and how was all that interaction when you're in Chula Vista, they're going to LA, they're heading over to Beijing and you still got a shot because you're at the mm -hmm. end of the games, right. but you don't know. Right. And that was exactly it. Just, I, it was hard because for me, obviously it's, it was just a, it was a roller coaster because some days it was, I woke up and I was like, I'm going to be all right. I'm resting up. Let me enjoy this. I haven't been able to rest for a long time. I'm just going to like watch some Netflix and that it's going to be good. I'm gonna have a good breakfast. You know, I woke up and I was ready to do something. And then later that day I'm in tears because it's like, I'm not going to the games. It's just, it was just this draining. I think that the variation on that spectrum was more draining than it because it's just hard some days that's just a little bit of it and i did feel that support it was really that was something that made meant a lot to me it was it was hard sometimes because sometimes it's like you don't want to hear it and other times it's like i want to hear everybody tell me that i'm going to be okay and other times you're just in this shell i guess for lack of a better word but it was it was like i, I constantly had people reaching out to me and it was so nice because it just though i was feeling very alone <laughs> like physically because i was in quarantine that made it a lot better because it was constant. I got to talk to somebody on the phone or I got to message somebody and I just felt like people, and, and it was even really interesting. Like the, the news traction I got, I, I, it was so strange to me because my friend of my dad like reached out to him. He's like, Hey, I just saw your son, like on the, I don't know, like the nightly news or something. And he's like, what? And he asked me about it. I'm like, Hey, he probably means like local news. And it was like, it was like CBS nightly news or something. I was like, and not really the reason I want to be on, news but i guess it's something you know what i mean so that was to me like little things like that and then i'd look at some of the comments and people were very supportive and it was just something that that those kind of stuff did mean a lot even though it was a little bit of a consolation prize in some ways it just made me feel less alone i guess is the best way to put it and it kept my spirits up at the times when it was really easy for them to get down i guess and i think that's probably why it helped, helped me get better faster frankly at the end of the day I cleared when I was supposed to, but there's no guarantees with that. But I think people keeping me in a positive attitude helps because everybody knows if you're stressing out, putting stress on the body, the immune system's going to drop. So it's really hard to think about the fact that, hey, the more negative you are, you might not get better faster, but how do you not be negative in that situation? So I think a lot of people banding around me and helping honestly probably helped me get better, frankly, just to be as frank as I can. I think it really helped in a lot of ways. How long did it take for you to start testing negative or get your CT levels to a point where they'd let you on a plane? So it was really interesting. It, was fun. it wasn't funny in the moment, I guess, but a funny process when I look back at it is like we, so we're, we were testing at the time at the University of San Diego Medical Network because that was, that was, I guess, nearest to the <laughs> training center. And that was like the, you know, that was the most official. And they are, they were partnered with them somehow for like. Oh, oh, oh we, we know. We, we know we all know. about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, yeah, so we did that. Right. And then we were there for. But it was the hard part was they'd only those tests would get back at like, like I'd take them first thing in the morning because they needed to be at a certain time. So really early. And we'd, we'd send them out and then they wouldn't get back some days till like 4 a.m. the next day is when I would get the results. So it was hard the whole day. I wasn't really sure, like, am I even making progress? And, and with that, what was really interesting to me was in the U.S., I guess it's not very common for them to give you a, a CT threshold number. So like the cycle threshold, they, that number doesn't really get, doesn't really exist, I guess, or they just don't have access to it. Where in Europe, they immediately give it to you. And that's just like with the test. And I guess I was actually the funniest part of all this, I guess, is my teammate, Kyle Wilcox at the time, he was in Chula Vista with me and he, cause he was flown in late cause we had uh, Nick Taylor, our alternate athlete had tested positive as well. So in the event, he would not be able to get out. They needed to bring Kyle over. So Kyle was also actually came in late to do this process with me towards the end of it, right before we left. And he actually used to work on, I think it's, what are they called? Uh, PCR testing, because they also use that for other things. He uses it where he built these devices that people, the military uses out in the field to test for like anthrax. And like, those are like the same devices that we use to test COVID at the high level, like PCR. And I guess all it is is a 
rapid heating and cooling. And every time they do that, I guess it looks for something. And if it shows up after every cycle, that's when you test positive. If nothing shows up after 40 cycles, you're just negative. Maybe it would have tested positive at 50, but the machine cuts off at 40. And that's what China was asking to get it at 40. So it turned into a bit of a game of, can we find testing centers that only test to 35 cycle threshold? Because though it's not going to keep me negative in China, I can at least start accumulating negative tests because they're testing at a lower threshold. Like if, if I can get by 35 passes, then I get a negative. So just it just accumulating negative tests is going to be good for me. So we ended up driving like an hour and a half around trying to figure this stuff out, trying to get the different testing sites. Because at this point, the Olympic Committee is like, whatever we can do to get you over there, we're going to attempt at least. And uh, it was just hard, though, because most places didn't know what that was. We bring up cycle threshold, and they're like, what do you mean? Like the test just says you're negative or you're positive. But I was, I was like explaining to them how their machine worked, <laughs> you know, trying to explain, okay, on this cycle, I will test positive. And can you tell me what that number is? Or does your machine even do that? And it was like pulling teeth sometimes because they just didn't know. And it's not like, not like they needed that information, but that was something that we really had to dig into. And I, I learned more about COVID tests in that like two and a half week period than I ever want to know in my entire life. Like, I just, I don't care anymore. I don't want to think, I don't want to think about it. <laughs> you know, like I know too much. It's not my field. <laughs> I don't even want to look at it anymore, you know? So it was, uh, that was an interesting process for sure. But I, that was just this juggling act and trying to get negative tests, but knowing that, Hey, that negative test doesn't guarantee me entry to China, because even if I test negative here at 35, I get to China and I test positive under 40, who cares? I go into quarantine there. So I still need to get over 40, but like trying to navigate that, how that system is in the U S of some places do this. And like some places it's based out of a old gas station and other places it's like the hospital. So it's kind of like trying to find which one does what, and it's just a, you know, it was a crazy process, but we ended up figuring it all out and it ended up working out, but it was just, that was the juggling act. I think towards the end of it was how can we get a negative as soon as possible just to start accumulating them, just to have a body of work of, Hey, he's been negative for a week and a half, you know? Right. You had to have, you had to have the 96 hour test, the 72 right. hour. So you finally get all your tests. At what point did you fly out? I want to say I flew out. So I got in, I don't know the exact dates, but I got in a day before or the first day of official training for two man, which is hard because initially my goal was if I can get there earlier, I was in contention for a two man spot. And eventually I just, you know, this coach said to sit me down and say, Hey, it's not, we're sorry. And this isn't performance based, but you're just, we're, obviously it's no, it's you at risk for you. If you get there two days before the race and we ask you to race, you can hurt yourself. You may not perform as well. And you can't do four man like and i understood that the closest so that was hard that was one of the many hard things of that process was i had to kind of step away from the two-man running but that i got there i think the day before or the first day of official training was the first day i was on the ground in china so that's three days before the race so i want to say that's puts me like they're probably a week and a half or a week already into the games i want to say i got in like the end of the first or second week of the Olympics. I think I can't remember exactly, but the funny part, again, I don't, I didn't really post this part. Cause at this point I was so just like, I got on the ground in China and the airport test was, I, I'm sure it was brutal. It was, that was the worst. They put it in your nose and they leave it for like 30 seconds. And you're just sitting there with this like thing sticking out of your <laughs> nose. Like, what are you going to take it? Like, what am I doing here? And they finally come back and they get it out. And that one, I tested positive on first one on the ground. So I was, I was in the hotel there in China. I get a call saying you did test positive, but they didn't have my value for me, but I didn't again. Okay. And I, then I'm just crushed again. I'm in shambles. Cause I'm like, okay, I'm going to be stuck quarantine here. Everyone's going to leave now. And I'm going to be stuck in China on top of not being able to compete. I'm going to now quarantine again in a hotel in China. So I, that was sucked. And then they came to do a confirmatory test and they came like, 10 minutes after they told me I tested positive. So not only it was like five in the morning, I get a knock on my door and it's like two people in hazmat suits. And I'm like, okay, they're going to take me to real quarantine now. Like, but they just kind of walked in, took my test and they said, okay, thank you. And left. And I walked out. I'm like, is that it? Like, do I need anything else? And they said, no, you're good. But they did this all like 5.00 AM. So for me, I'm like, at this point, I'm like eating and sleeping at weird hours. I can't sleep. I'm so worried. And that one ends up being negative. 
And they're supposed to, in that case, do another confirmatory test. But for some reason, Beijing, I think the Olympic Committee pushed hard enough, like, hey, this guy's been through enough. And they actually waived that test and said, you're just good to go. Like, you can now reenter the, the village. Like, you're just, you can go ahead. Like, they finally threw me a bone there after the last three weeks of jumping through hoops for all that. But that was kind of the last hurdle there. And I didn't post anything about that because at that point, I was just, I was just so, like, devastated and then it ended up working out luckily and because what happened was that test i was like a 39 and i needed to be over a 40 but i didn't know that so as far as i knew i wasn't even close so thank thank god it was higher than that the next test passed and they let me out and then everything went but i was just so drained going into the olympics after that you know it was just really hard to i was just i was excited to be there but i was also i just felt like a zombie i was like walking around i just felt like like it was just like it's like I was just there, <laughs> you know, I've just been so drained. So you, you finally test all negative. You get to the Yangqing uh, Athletes Village. You're there. You don't know what day it is. You don't know what time it is. And you've had so many tests, you probably can't even feel the inside of your nose and throat anymore. Right. And now you got your get in your head to do the most important race of your life. Yes. And that was exactly, yeah, that was, a, that was the hardest part probably. Mm-hmm. So where, where was your head going and what was happening around you and, and how was that experience? Honestly, it's hard because I don't know if it's always what I had to kind of grapple with this the last like couple months right after the Olympics, because it's not something that you want to admit to yourself. And it's not something I like saying, because I don't, I feel like it's not what people want to hear, but I was, I was just like, I don't know. I was. I almost the excitement was just gone, which is really sad because I worked for so long, so hard to want to perform at that race. And then I get there and it was like, and I don't know, for lack of a better word, I wanted it to be over. I felt like I'd missed it. I got on the line and I pushed and I was, and I was really actually pretty proud of myself. Cause I'm like, Oh wow. I wasn't nervous at all. Like I didn't feel any butterflies. I wasn't anxious. That was the best I've handled that. Then later that day, I realized like that might actually not be a good thing. I didn't feel anything. I wasn't excited. It was just like, you just drained. And again, I, I can only attribute it to two or three weeks of highest highs and lowest lows, hours apart sometimes. It just was taxing, I think is the only way to put it. I trained well when I got there. I had some great weeks. I was pushing as well as I ever have. I don't think it really affected my performance. I just, I think it's really hard, I guess, to accept. Though I feel like I have accepted now is like, and I feel like a lot of it just kind of was taken away and that's sad, but at the same time, I want to continue and I, there's a lot more that I want to do. And I'm really grateful for the experience because I think there's a lot of positives that came from it. I think there's a lot of things that I learned about myself and ways that I learned that I, if I can handle that, I feel like I can handle anything. And that's, again, just, I feel like it took at first me accepting that it's okay for me to say that I was just, I was just sad. I was numb to it at the point of the race. It was like the race, most important race in my life up until that point. I didn't even feel anything, and I, and I wish I did. But at the end of the day, I still want that feeling. I still feel like I can get that feeling moving forward, kind of looking towards the next Olympics. What was the village like? Because you were there. Really wait, nice. were you there maybe all of five or six days? Yeah, I would say that. I think it was six or seven days. Okay. So I got a, I got a good amount and, and my girlfriend's there. So again, it was on top of all of this, not to mention poor Kristen, it was so hard on her. Cause again, not only is she wishing I was there, it'd been a long year and we got really stressed towards the end of the year with COVID. So we tried to stop see each other as much because we didn't want to, you know, give it to each other or anything. And that was something that was even harder then because we get, she gets to the Olympics and on top of me not being able to be there for her in a stressful time, she also has the survivor's guilt where she obviously like, I'm not upset with her, but it's hard to see somebody who I care about enjoy something that I want as well. Like the Olympics, like the opening ceremonies. And that's with my teammates too. But with her, especially like she's in this weird spot where she doesn't want to make me feel bad, but I want her to enjoy herself. But I, but it's just, I, so I don't want to drain down her, but I'm also going through one of the hardest times of my life. So it was, it was a hard thing for her too, but that was a big thing was the village. I got to explore with her. One of the nice, she, she waited to see everything until I got there because I was telling her how much it worried me that, or one of my biggest things was that even though everything was going to be there for me, I was going to experience it all secondhand, I guess. You know what I mean? And she waited to not do anything 
until I got there, which was really sweet of her. So we went around my whole first day in the village. We just walked around the village and saw everything and got to do everything and try all the, the little virtual reality games and do all this stuff that it was, that made, that made my day. And it definitely made, it was one of those bright spots in an otherwise pretty tough couple of weeks. So that was good. And the village is beautiful. I mean, the facilities were immaculate. Training facilities like the track was the nicest track I've ever been to. The indoor track is there's an indoor warm-up area the floor is heated there's food court downstairs like it was there's a walk way over the top of the track the track looks like a dragon it was unbelievable every other track we warm up in a parking lot that's snowing in east germany and here we're in like an indoor sprint hall with with like heated floors it was unbelievable you know it was beautiful and the, the villages as well the rooms are a little small because we have four bobsledders in them but I don't think that was, I think that was just our village. I think other villages had different rooms and stuff. And, but at the end of the day, it was, the facilities were incredible. But I guess, what else do you expect, you know, <laughs> China? What kind of fun stuff did they have in the village for you to do? There was a cool little game area. It was like, they had some like virtual reality stuff where you like, you know, like think of like, I don't know if you've been on those with the roller coaster simulators where you get in it and it moves around. There's stuff like that. There's this laser tag where you put this headset on and there's nothing in front of you guys. You're almost like fenced in, but there's nothing there, but you see barricades when you put it on and you can play with like one other person and run around and play laser tag. That was cool. A lot of just cool artwork, cool statues. They had a couple I'm trying to think what else there was obviously cafeteria was good they had the pizza hut and the kfc there which was fun that was a familiar taste when you didn't feel like eating in the cafeteria sometimes and other than that just the, just walking around the facilities were really beautiful the volunteers were wonderful i mean that the chinese people were some of the sweetest people i've ever met it was it was pretty incredible to, to be over there and they just put on such a you know they were wonderful there's people waving at you everywhere you go i was telling hunter like we were on the bus the closing ceremonies and i was talking to some of my teammates and we're all like it's gonna be really weird going back to the states and not like walking off the plane and doing like one of these to somebody because you're gonna get like punched in the face in newark or something if you like wave to some random stranger they're like what's your problem but in china everybody's waving to you and everybody you walk by is waving to you <laughs> so it was, <laughs> was kind of cool just because they made it they were very sweet people and it was yes. all the pen trading and stuff and it was so, I mean, yeah, the, the village itself was beautiful and the facilities. I don't know how you beat that, you know. So in your cafeteria, did you have robot food preparation as well? Because we had that in our cafeteria. We had a whole bunch of like a whole wall of robot cooking and things like that. No, I did. While I was in the hotel, I got in. I wasn't in a quarantine hotel, luckily. I was in like, I think I was in like the Marriott or something, which was beautiful hotel. I mean, it was like so nice. It was nice Marriott I ever stayed in. There was a shower from like the rain top shower and like bed, huge beds. Like, and then the, for while I was technically supposed to be quarantining, they would let me go to the bobsled track and back. I just was not allowed to stay in the village for a few days until I cleared some tests. But they, the, the food would come to me with a robot. And that was cool. The robot would like show up to the door. And it was funny because if you stand in front of it, I can't remember what it said, but it was like something around the, it was along the lines of like, I am working. Like, you are beautiful. Move, please. Like, it was like something like weird. <laughs> and that's what it would say to you. It's like, I am working. Move, please. Thank you, beautiful. Like, <laughs> it was so weird. But it was cool. Like, it, it, that delivered food to me. So I got a kick out of that every time it came to the door. But uh, that was really it. The, the hotel was beautiful, though. That was that was pretty cool. Once I got to go down for breakfast a few times at the hotel, it was like wow. They they blew the doors off on the, on the food there. But it was a little, uh, little ego stroking with every meal. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, it was pretty funny. I'd like stand in front of it on purpose and like take a video of it to send to like my girlfriend or something, <laughs> just tell her that the robot was hitting on me. <laughs> See, you had a much better experience. I had a robot at the main media center who had beef with me. Oh, you like it? <laughs> yeah, because every time I would pass, it was one of the cleaning robots, and every time I would oh. pass by, it would turn and look at me. And I'm like, I, I and yeah, I think it was because I walked on the escalators. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, uh, the cleaning was out of control. It was crazy how, I mean, obviously, I, they were very thorough, but it was like, wow. It was, they were, I saw at one point, I saw somebody hosing down a tire of a car with like bleach i'm like wow I'm like what is this? Like, what's going on here was, but i mean i guess again they were very thorough when i had to go from the hotel to the track those days 
I wasn't allowed to use, you know, public transportation. Cause again, I hadn't really cleared. And when I was at the track, every athlete who was around me, like my teammates would have to sign like a, something saying like they are understanding of a risk of being around me kind of thing. Like it was, it was a process, but when we did all that, there's a guy where it's almost similar to like an Uber, I guess, like a taxi who took me to and from, but I didn't realize until the second day that he was only for me. Like it was, I realized that cause he was he dropped me off at like 10 and he's like, I'll be back at five to pick you up. And it's like, okay, perfect. And then I realized when I come back down, that he's in the same spot I left him because he's not allowed to go mingle that car with other groups since I was in it and I was considered a high risk case. So when he would get back, obviously they just hose the car down. I'm sure he would test a couple of times, but he was only assigned to me though. We, we had like plastic screen, mask, mask, like no access at all. It was like the thoroughness was incredible stuff. I would have never thought of, you know, that I, maybe it matters. I don't know, but it was, it was crazy. It was pretty thorough. You know, was, I saw a lot of that. One of my burning questions, how did you get from the athletes village to the bobsled track? Because so they had, weren't that physically far away from each other, but I know. But yeah, like but we really have had it. we had horrible. The reason I could not go and see you was just getting to Yangqing was horrible, and I, I'm very curious as because the one time I did go, getting back was was also a a massive process, but it involved going from the ski side to the bobsled side, and how did you get there? I, I don't remember the name off the top of my head. I should because I took the bus so many times. It was like the T Y or something. Like again, they had all those things yeah, like, yeah. labeled as like T this or that. And that was it was it was the same one every day and that and you knew the exact spot you got on and off and that was the only way you knew it was like somebody told you and that was the that was the only thing we used every time. There was one shuttle that went straight to the crates, which is where we store our sleds. And from that area, there's a shuttle that goes straight to the top and back. And those are the only two that we used. So you kind of just like got used to using the same one because it was the same little shuttle. But operating, from what I heard, I, I didn't attempt to even leave the village because at that point I was too close to competition. But from what I heard, going anywhere outside of the <laughs> village was a nightmare. And going to like any other sporting venue was just brutal from what I heard. Because yeah. I was like, we had, we had other friends like, oh, let's go see the women's hockey final or like, let's go see this or that. It was not even an option. And if they did, my girlfriend mentioned, I kind of thought about it and it made sense. They made it really tough to do it because they put everything on certain times. Like the buses run X amount of time. And if the last bus is at midnight and the game lead ends at 1150, how can you go watch the game? You know? And so it almost like in a weird way, I think I understand what she's saying. Maybe they were dissuading people from moving around because one, everything was so separated. Every village was a couple hours apart. And two, the buses were at such tough times starting competition to go venue to venue that like maybe that was pro part of dissuading people from moving around a lot for athletes at least from moving around because that was i don't know many athletes who got to go see anything outside of their immediate village or venue because it was just so complicated and it was so hard to go anywhere or get approved to go do things like it was just it was a lot we're just grateful that there were french people around because otherwise allison would still be in Yangcheng. <laughs> <laughs> she almost got stuck there. <laughs> oh, no. Jeez. It was an odyssey. <laughs> it is. It really is. Getting around there was incredible. We just went to, like, closing ceremonies, and we're all on the same bus, so this is simple. You get on the bus, and it just takes you there. You got to stop at this, like, middle security checkpoint where you all get off the bus, and you walk through more security, take all your phone out, like your TSA, you go through metal detector, and then you get back on that same bus, and then you go the other half of the drive. So it was like, you did that before you got on the bus, middle of the road, then when you got to ceremonies, you did it again. So it was like very thorough. And a funny story, I guess, not to sidetrack too much, but my teammate, Charlie Volker, he had like been given a the big US Olympic Committee signs. They had these like stickers they'd hang on the windows in the village, the big ones. And they gave him one because they had an extra because he asked for it. So they gave him one, it was probably this big rolled up piece of paper, it looks like a poster board. And he couldn't fit it in his luggage. And we're going straight from closing to the airport. And they said, you had to have your bags packed before you leave for closing. They go to a certain place. You'll see him again at the airport. So he couldn't fit it in. He's like, I'm just going to carry it through closing ceremony. And I'm like, why? I, I, I argued with him. I'm like, fine, do it. Like, he was being stubborn about it. I'm like, you're not going to carry that for the next four hours. But he did anyway. So we take it on the bus. And the funniest part is, I think between the time we get on the bus 
or I guess to that middle checkpoint till we actually walk in closing ceremonies, I think he had to open that thing like 15 times. Because anytime any security worker saw him, you know, they're very nice to the athletes. They're, but then they, as soon as they saw that, it's like our bus had to stop. Five guys came on the bus, looked around, saw him, like pointed him out and said, show us what that says right now. Because <laughs> they think it's going to be like a political statement. They think he has a poster board for closing ceremonies that he's going to like open up. So he shows it to him. And then they were like, oh, thank you. Like, have a great day. But when they first got on the bus, they're like, show me that. Like, they were no nonsense, like, pissed off. Like, you got to show me what that says. And then he shows them, and they're like, oh, thanks. Like, have a great time at closing. But they were all nice. But that happened, like, 15 times, maybe. We got to the, like, holding area for the athletes before closing. Every time a security guard walked by him, they'd see that thing and walk right over and say, show me it. <laughs> so and at one point, he left it with me because he went to go get food. And then I had to show it to, like, four people. Because I happen to be the guy sitting right next to it. I'm like, it's not even mine, but they make me show it to him <laughs> because he left it with me. Yeah, it was, but it was just funny because I'm like that. Like every single security guard that walked by Charlie checked his poster board just to make sure it didn't say something that was not supposed to be said at closing ceremonies. <laughs> So uh, along that vein, there was no podium protests. I mean, no. the only thing that we saw was the one Ukrainian slider held yeah. up the, the no uh, war in Ukraine. What did the USOPC tell you before you left? What were you instructed? I even think, I think honestly, I don't know if I have to, they had to say much because really what happened was we had a couple times before going to China. I don't know if every country did this, but we did. And we had a couple briefings with the State Department with like potential athletes who are going. And then as you get closer, like athletes who are definitely going. And it was just, you could ask questions. And then we had somebody from, from the Chinese embassy, like the US embassy in China. We had somebody from the State Department who focuses most of their work on China. We had people from human rights groups that have worked closely about stuff in China. So like they had a lot of experts like just briefing us on their, what to expect. And it was like for lack of a better word, it was terrifying. Like what they explained. And so this is the first meeting we had was like a year out. And at that point I was telling my parents like, Hey, even if you can go, I don't think you should, I don't feel comfortable. It would stress me out a lot to know you guys are over there on your own, just kind of with no, you have no media, you have no athlete credential. You're just there. Like, I don't want to worry about that. We're luckily going to be shuttled place to place, but if you guys have to figure that out on your own, and if you do go, I want you to have like a group you're with or like security, like something that's too expensive, but I just like, it's going to be just the stuff they went over was tough. And it was stuff that I didn't want scared me, let alone scared me having my parents there with them having no protection from the Olympic committee. And that was something that they just mentioned that really basic, I guess, at the premise of what it all came down to from the U.S. government, their stance was, if you get in trouble, there's very little we can do. That one of the things they talk about is like, if you are detained, we push to be able to see you, but we cannot be your legal counsel. And there's like a 95% conviction rate in the Chinese court or something. So they're like, whatever you're accused of usually sticks. So it's kind of like, it was just like, I think most people were just realistic enough to think, if there are, if I have problems with things, if you were, they made it very clear that as soon as you step in that nation, you have to abide by that nation's laws. Just like if they came to the U.S., they have to abide by the U.S.'s laws, even if they're not the same laws. And that was what they tried to stress was, hey, things that you lean on and saying things that you feel are your unalienable right in the U.S. is not the case in China, no matter if you are a U.S. citizen or any other citizen. And that's what they just stressed. They said, hey, we're not going to say we're going to advise you not to say anything, but if you do, we're just trying to explain to you the gravity of the situation. But I think they did a good enough job at that, that people realize like there's plenty of times and places to make your stance known. But when you're on the ground in China, that might not be a great time to do that for yourself, first, just for well-being or safety, I guess, for lack of a better word. And I think that might've been why it went off so smoothly, frankly, because it was, if you have something to say, you have plenty of time to say it. But if you're in China, that. It, it feels a little different when you're there with no other people other than staff and media. It's not like they're citizens of the U.S. there. You're just there kind of on your own almost in a bubble, and you feel very controlled by what they're telling you. You can't go here. You can't go here. We'll take you here. You cannot go anywhere past this point. So you already feel very controlled, and then you're like, if I speak out, you know, like, for lack of better words, they, they did a good job of under explaining the gravity of being over there as an athlete and that rights that we have in the U.S. are not the same everywhere else. And that you have to know that when you're going to other nations. 
You mentioned mom and dad. How were they through this whole process? This must have been more, almost more upsetting and scary for them because they just had to sit there. Yeah. And ex- and it, exciting and disappointing, million different feelings probably. Yeah. It, I mean, it broke my heart when I texted, I had to text him and say, like, I had tested positive. Like that was the night it happened. It was like 11 PM my time. So they were well asleep because they were in the East coast. And when they woke up the next morning, obviously I woke up to 20 calls and it was, I felt horrible telling him, but uh, what ended up happening was my dad ended up when I got to LA finally. So initially I went to Chula Vista. I wasn't, couldn't really go to Los Angeles because I was still testing positive. Eventually when I started testing negative, they wanted me to go to LA because that's where we actually stage team processing. That's where the U S Olympic committee staffs there. And that's where we can actually, you know, they have more control over the testing. They have a better relationship with the hospital there so they can do everything themselves. It's all in house done by the U S OPC. So when we got there, he actually met me there. We double checked the Olympic and Paralympic committee staff that he'd be able to come. They let him and they let him stay at the hotel, not in my room, but with me and be there for me. Cause he just, again, in the event that I don't get to go, he didn't want me to be alone and already had been such a tough time. And they were so sweet to him. They, I wanted, I went down there asking to buy a shirt for him because we had all the team processing gear there. And I'm like, Hey, can I just buy a shirt for him? Like he's all the way out here and I'd love to get him something. And they're like, absolutely not. They gave him like $500 and like jackets and shirts. It was so sweet of them. And just one, they took care of me incredible amount. But at the top of that, like taking care of my family, like it just, it made a really, the, the staff there, the team USA staff in LA was like they made a really bad process for me just as good as it possibly could have been they they were so unbelievable and just so understanding and so helpful and so when he when i went over there he got to come out which is really nice my mom wanted to come out but she she works at the school so she has a lot harder time uh, getting off but she works at a high school here locally so he came out for a few days and once things are going better for me he went back because obviously he has work as well but he was going to come out really as long as he had to to just kind of be there just in case and that obviously meant the world to me I, I had my staff there, and at that point, I had Kyle, my teammate, and I had our high performance director and some coaches who had tested positive flying from other parts of the nation. So I wasn't the only one by any means who tested positive, but I had been pretty alone in Chula Vista. So it was nice to just start being around people. And once he saw that I had other people there, he felt more comfortable letting me be there, not just thinking I was alone at some hotel in LA while my whole team was in China. <laughs> you know, they, uh, there were people there as well. So unfortunately, unfortunately, there were other athletes and staff who were in the same boat I was. So I wasn't totally alone once I got to the official Team USA hotel, I guess, for staging. So when you actually raced, I cried. I admit that. Have your parents admitted to tears? My dad hasn't, but my so what was really cool was the event they did for my parents out for the fans, friends and family out in Park City. They did a really awesome, awesome job with that. I mean, my parents were so excited and they, they flew them out there. You get two people flown out, flights covered, combinations covered, open bar, food, everything. Again, they just give them gifts and you can try this and that. Like, I, again, the Olympic Paralympic Committee made it really tough Olympics, I think, so good. I was trying to tell them that when we were at this event this weekend where they were asking, for, they were reviewing, how did we do at the games? Here's some sheets to fill out. I just, I didn't know what else to say other than like, I just want somebody to understand that it was a tough Olympics due to a lot of the organizing committee, how they ran it so strictly. But from the U.S. side, like, they made it incredible. Like, they came up with creative things that I would have never even imagined to just make my family's day, like, let alone the athlete in China being taken care of. They did such a good job with that. And they went out to that, and my, as fun, my dad's best friend from high school actually met them out there because they let them have buddy passes to get somebody into the event, though he had to fly out there on his own and stay at his own place. But they let him in every day. So open bar food, which was definitely worth it. And he was there and he, he was over at our house here a couple of weeks ago and told us, told me that he had never seen that look on my dad's face, how emotional he was when he watched me push on my first heat. It was like, he was in like shell shock. He said he couldn't even move. It was pretty, he said it was, it was pretty, cool thing for him to see and he wanted to communicate that to me because he knew my dad would never tell me that <laughs> but he, he communicated that with me and he said he had never seen that look on his face before and I thought that meant a lot to me for sure so that was a, it's a special time at the end of the day though it was a definitely a tough experience for me it's a, I think the coolest part was getting even if it wasn't as perfect as it could have been for me I think it was still very perfect for a lot of people who supported me 
And that was like the best part of the whole thing, I think, was getting everybody else who had been supporting me and watching me and cheering for me and was so invested in me and had spent so much, put so much effort into me. For them to be able to watch me compete at the Olympics, even if it wasn't how I expected or wanted, you got to be happy about that. Hearing from your friends and family saying that they're proud of you and that you made them proud is that's all you're trying to do, right? Is trying to make people who mean a lot to you and your nation proud of you. And I think that's exactly, if I didn't do anything, at least I feel like I kind of could do that for some people. So that made it all of it a lot more worth it. I think going through all that definitely was not in vain. And it was not for nothing. Well, all of Shutflistan was very we, proud. We're very proud. <laughs> Thank you guys. We were. It means, it we're, means a lot. We were so excited. It was kind of embarrassing. You guys, I mean, it's just been cool. You guys have been around with me literally since my first two weeks at the training center. Yeah. Like, like I hadn't, I didn't know anybody on the team at that time, let alone anything about bobsled, but I got to know you guys. <laughs> so it's like in, some, in some ways, I knew and you your life has never been the sport. same since. You, you really, like that was at a point in my life where a lot of things were changing. I didn't know anybody in Lake Placid. So I was kind of alone there because I was getting to know the team, but like I, they're all trying to make an Olympic team and I'm just kind of there <laughs> like training Here. and learning, but I'm not in the running for the team or anything. So and then I got to talk to you guys and I'm like, just, I don't know. It was nice to sit down and have a conversation with somebody when a lot of the day was spent me trying to not be awkward and trying to not say awkward things to people I looked up to. And I got to come see you guys and actually sit down and talk and have like this long conversation. And I was like, wow, that felt good to have some social interaction, <laughs> not feel like I'm trying to not be judged because I don't want to like say something dumb as the young rookie in the Olympic okay, year. That's our whole show. <laughs> feel every time we talk to people. Yeah, so it's been really cool having you guys kind of a part of that journey with me. It's just like, I don't know. It's, I identify you guys as like day one, first week I was in Lake Placid. I talked to you guys and now I'm not done competing, but here we are five years later and I'm coming off my first Olympics and I don't know. It's just kind of, it's kind of cool. It's pretty surreal. I think I, I really enjoy catch, catching up with you guys every time. <laughs> it's just really special to me. All these, all these big points. So Milan is on the table. Have you, you have said. You're going to stick around, which I'm thrilled. Yeah, 100%. How, gonna have to how are you feeling going guys. into this kind of second quad? Now you you know what this is going to be like. You know what mm -hmm. you're up against. I think I've really, something, the most interesting thing I've realized, I'm, I'm a very obsessive person. I, I I cannot put things down, especially when I really like them, and especially with like sport. I, I've been an athlete as long as I can remember. And that's something that for me, I can, it's almost bad for me sometimes because I can, Everybody talks about how you got to be so committed and so obsessed. And that that's, I just don't find that. I don't know. I, I don't find that to be true because I find that comes very naturally to me, but it's the, the hard part is putting it down because that's so much better for you. You can't do this one thing for so long without other things in your life because either you're going to get burned out on it, which I really haven't, or you're going to do it. So you're going to focus so much energy into it. Eventually as you get better, you see less returns less frequently. It's like my first year weightlifting, your, your max is going to go up 100 pounds. Your eighth year weightlifting, you're going to push a whole year of weightlifting to try to get 10 pounds. So it's, it's discouraging when you put so much effort into something and it's just naturally, the better you get at it, the less improvements you're going to see. And that's, that's just the name of the game. That's part of doing sport and getting better at it. So I think the biggest thing I've noticed this last like year, and especially now recently, is almost just this idea of having this more, trying to become this more diverse person, having interests outside of sport that you can just lean on. Like I really love reading. I, I really love, not really great for sport. I've gotten into craft beer a little bit. Like I have guys on my team who are into it. And it's just things where like, it's stuff I balance with sport, not stuff that I just, I don't drink all the time. And I especially can't do that in season, but it's more just like at times like now I can go to some breweries and just pursue things that I've, I'm passionate about that aren't bobsled. Because I feel if it were up to me, all I would do is be an athlete, but I can't do that all day and I can't do that forever. So I think for me, it's been really interesting is I feel almost more equipped to per perform better because I feel like I'm becoming a more well-rounded man, I guess, if that makes sense. I'm not just, the last thing I want to be is to myself in the mirror and say, I am an athlete. I want to be a person, <laughs> you know, who does sport. <laughs> I'm a person who, who my job is an athlete, but that's not. It's like anybody, you don't want to be your job, right? And that's something that I had to come and grapple with this last quad. I think that's the biggest growing experience I've had was my dad, it's the best advice he ever gave me was I had a bad performance one year at 
some race and I called him in shambles. I was so upset that I didn't perform well and I've worked so hard at it. And he just told me, he's like, Josh, you, you gotta be, you gotta give yourself some slack kid. You got, you gotta cut yourself some slack and you're, you're more than an athlete. He's like, if you stop bobsledding tomorrow, you, there's still so much more you offer to people and there's so much more you can do. And there's so much more out there for you that you, you just, you're more than this. And you can't, you can't just, you can't just say you're just an athlete cause you're not. And you gotta remember that. And that's something that, I mean, it's just stuck with me. That was like two years ago, probably. And that's stuck with me for a long time that now it's like, that's my goal almost right now. And I've seen that I've been doing better in training. And I see better performances, the more well-rounded I feel, I guess. And for lack of a better word, my, one of my goals now is I have a lot of goals in sport, but one of my most important goals in life right now is to be more diverse as a, as a person, as a man, just try to be more, find more interest and pursue those interests as well. Cause that the guy gives me balance. And then I show up to training even more excited because instead of just thinking about training for 24 hours and getting there and doing it, I trained, I did something else for the other 18 hours of the day. And then I was, I get back to training the next day and I'm excited to do it because it's fresh and I haven't been obsessing over it for the whole day when I finished, <laughs> you know, it's not, my day isn't broken into training times I train and times I don't train. Training is just one of the things I do on that day. And that's kind of been a mindset shift. That's hard. It's not very natural for me, but the more I've invested into it, trying to force myself to think that way, honestly, the better I've done in sport and the better I've felt outside of sport. Cause when you have those losses they are less crushing, cause that's not everything you are. It's not like your whole identity being taken from you from a bad performance. So I think that's been something pretty cool that I've been pursuing and I'm excited for this four years because of that. I think that can take a lot of what I'm doing to a new level in, in some way, just stepping back to, to do better. And then it's almost counterintuitive thinking, but <laughs> It's been a hard thing to wrap my head around, but I've seen some pretty good results from it. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Josh, thank you again for spending time with us. We love being able to talk with you. It's very special. Like you said, it's very special to us, too. Like you were our first interview. You helped us figure out what the show should be. And you stuck around and talked to two weird women every once in a while. <laughs> I I love talking to y'all. And I just, I don't know. Thank you so much for I don't know, keeping up with me and yeah. keeping, I don't know, keeping me on. Thank you so much, Josh. You can follow Josh on Insta and Twitter at JWilliamsonUSA. Okay, a couple things we need to explain. Mm -hmm. Josh is in a lovely relationship with Kristen Bushnowski, who was a pusher for Christine De Bruyn for Canada. So we, we mention her at various points and people are like, this is Kristen. And it's fine because they are Instagram official. Okay. <laughs> so it was okay that we talked about Kristen. And we also found out that Mama K listens to the show. <laughs> so, hi, hi, Mrs. Williamson. We love your son. We do. Hello. It's so sweet. I mean, his parents seem like such wonderful people and such a good support system. And yeah, I, just, I love it when we get to talk to Josh. So I just don't want to gush anymore because that's all well, I'll do. The good news is, with any luck, we'll all be together in Italy. That would be great. Wouldn't that be fun to, well, we will, we will remember that. We would like to take a minute to thank our Patreon patrons for providing financial support that is greatly needed to keep this show going. Uh, our patrons get a number of perks for support. And those include special bonus episodes of the show. So if you would like to learn more and support the show and keep our flame alive, please visit patreon.com slash flame alive pod. That sound means it's time for our history segment. And all year long, we are focusing on the Albertville 1992 Olympics. It is the 30th anniversary of those games. My turn for a story. Okay, so you know how we say every Olympian has a story? That is true. Well, there are like thousands of stories just within speed skating. Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm going to touch on one of those stories today. You will probably hear many more speed skating stories because they're all jaw dropping as we go. So this is the story of uh, Jacqueline Burner, who, spoiler alert, she, she won the gold medal in the 1500 meter long track speed skating short track was not in the games yet at this point so we are speed skating and we are also outside this is the last track that is outdoors 
if I if I'm correct, that you might have to fact check me on that. But I believe Albertville is the last outdoor t- track for speed skating. So Jacqueline was born in 1965. She did track and field until she was like 10 and then switched over to speed skating. She was born in East Germany, which is a, an interesting point because we're at 1992 and the Berlin Wall had fallen in 1989. So this is the first games where they're reunified as a country again. So she was a speed skater and was pretty good and was hoping to get chosen for 1988. Calgary was not selected because she was she had gotten a bad virus. So she's going to keep going and try to get into 1992. Things are going well. In 1990, she is the reigning world champ. Fast forward to August 15th. The wall is down. Countries are still separate. She and about 10 of her teammates are out cycling in a suburb of East Berlin called Wandlitz, which is home to many of the bigwigs in the East German Communist Party. And tensions are kind of high still at this point between East and West, and common people don't really like the communist police. So they're riding on the road, a car drives by them, and grazes two of the men she's cycling with. Those people have words with the driver. Driver drives off, turns around, comes back, plows right in to Jacqueline. Oh, do we know who this driver is? Is that part of your story? No, that no, I don't. That in my research, I could never find that the driver had been identified. Oh wow! But we're at, we're at that point where you need special databases to go back that far. Right. You know, so I, I'm sure there are stories about it because she was a big deal in speed skating at the time. So she woke up in the hospital. She had sustained head injuries, got a broken foot, tore some le- knee ligaments. She says, thankfully, the driver had been driving a Trabant, which is the n- uh, East German car with not the greatest reputation for being quality. Kind of the clown car of East Germany. <laughs> if Because he was driving a Trabi, she probably lived. <laughs> because oh, if gosh. he had been driving another type of car, she probably would have died from the impact. So she spends anywhere from three to four months in the hospital and another three to four months in a rehab center. During this time, the reunification happens. <laughs> so now you have even fewer spots available. Right. But the good thing about this is had had there not be, been reunification and Germany was could compete at one, the East German team would have just dropped her because they would have been like, you're injured, you're done. That would be saying. She thought, well, she'd probably retire, but in rehab, she got some sports psychology training, basically. And the mental training helped her get out of the the rehab center and gave her some focus to get back to skating again, which is really interesting because she had mentioned in in, an article in in one of the German press articles I found that, yeah, that helped her get back on the ice and she used what she learned in rehab in her future training. So her new club that she's in now rallies around her, helps her get back on the ice. She starts training in April 1991, returns to competition November 1991, And so we're just a few months before the Olympics. Was not placing higher than third in this time. But not not too bad, though. She still makes the team to go to Albertville. For the 1,500-meter race, there is a one-hour delay for warm weather. And even when they resumed skating, it was like 57 degrees outside. So you've got some sketchy ice conditions happening. Yes, and I, I was watching her race... And you can kind of see the water. But it, it, I couldn't tell if it was just ice shavings, but it also looked like water to me when, when they pushed back. I mean, at 57 degrees, you're going to have puddles. I mean, there's no... And you may have ducks in those puddles. I mean, that's springtime weather. Right. And we talked about the man-made snow and how brown it was in Beijing. All you can see is how green it is in Albertville in the background. Because not much snow and it's really warm like ooh, wow we complained about this but this would be something to complain about too she was in the first pair that went off had the best performance of anybody in the second half of the race 
and she got a time of 2.05.87 that held up to win the gold. Her German teammate, Gunda Niemann, who got second by five one hundredths of a second. So she got 205.92. The bronze medal went to a woman who was Japan's first female winter medalist. She was a two-time Olympic cyclist at 1988, 1992, and she would compete again in 1996 at cycling. None other than Seiko Hashimoto. Yeah, once you started, I was like, cycling. <laughs> oh, is this going to be Seiko Hashimoto, who then we got to know very well during Tokyo? Yes, as the head of the organizing committee. Who... The new head. Yes. Who replaced <laughs> Uncle Yoshi. Yoshi, <laughs> who had <laughs> some wandering hands and, a, and rather loose lips, shall we say. <laughs> So back to Jacqueline Borner. She also competed in the 3000. She placed eighth. The driver of that car, the Trabi, got a two-year sentence. The case was in litigation for years. And it was actually still being litigated when the games happened because of when the accident took place. Because it was seven weeks before reunification, there were questions about what laws applied and what, what, which country they would be tried under, but eventually did get a sentence, rather light one considering the, the accident, but some justice was served. I was going to say, he was probably the happiest man when that wall came down. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> considering you take out one of the East German prime athletes, he might have been up against that wall, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously. I love when we get cameos. <laughs> Welcome to Shukflastan. This is the time of the show when we check in with our past guests who make up Team Keep the Flame Alive. They are the citizens of our country, Shukflastan. Beach volleyball player Kelly Clace Chen and her partner Betsy Flint made the semifinals of the ABP Austin Open and lost to tournament winners Cloth and Noose. And sports agent Jesse Lichtenberg was on Market Price's YouTube show during their Women's History Month series. We will have a link to that in the show notes. <laughs> We've got some news from Paris 2024. The International Canoe Federation has released its qualification info and has reserved quota spots for extreme kayak. So it's a head-to-head -head race on the canoe slalom, of course. It's supposed to be fast-paced and exciting and popular with athletes and fans, good for TV, blah, blah, blah. They lost quota spots from Tokyo 2020 to make room for extreme they had to get rid of some events. They, uh, and they, they acknowledged it. And they said, basically, look, we have to evolve or die. We lost quota spots. They're not giving us more medal sports. So we have to cut something from somewhere. So what gets cut is from canoe sprint. They lost the K1 200 meter event for both the men and the women. And the men's C2 and K2 events went from 1,000 meters down to 500 meters. Well, Good news for Shuklastani Luca Jones because she races extreme slalom. Mm. So she was going to focus on canoe versus kayak because she does the extreme slalom, but this may kind of change her. So she may end up back into events in Paris. That would be very cool. Bad news for triple gold medalist Lisa Carrington. She has won the women's 200 meter event three times in a row, which is pretty much from what I can tell every time this is the 200 meters for women was raced, but the woman has a lot of medals. We are okay. <laughs> the, the Kiwis will somehow manage here. <laughs> Inside the Games has reported that the Department of Mayan has signed up to do the torch relay. So it a little French geography because I had to figure this out myself. France is broken up into regions and the regions are broken up into departments. And so this is the region of Pais de la Loire in northwestern France. They seem to be the first department that's signed up. We talked about this, I 
I want to say right after we got back from Beijing, that a lot of the departments and regions have been pushing back because of the cost. And who's going to cover the expense of the torch relay? And they, the federal government and the organizing committee said, it should be your honor to host the torch relay. And I don't know if the taxpayers would agree. So this could very well be the first to agree to this. And the interesting thing is, Inside the Games had reported early in March, and I think we talked about this too, the departments were given until March 11th to figure out whether or not they wish to participate. So if you have, by May, one department that has signed up and you want this torch to go everywhere, it's not looking good. This is a problem. And it, it, it would cost the department 150,000 euros to do this. Right, and if you're talking about I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot of money when you're talking about government events, but if you're talking about city budgets, town budgets, small county budgets, all of a sudden another 150,000 euros could mean that schools don't get money or other right. public works don't happen. So it's not like it's a rounding error of a federal budget kind of numbers. It, exactly. So I'm not surprised that this is lagging. I'm very curious to know what Paris 2024 wants to do about it. Here's what I want them to do. I have an idea for their torch relay. <laughs> and this would actually work better for Milan, but I'm going to put it in anyway. So do you remember when Pope John Paul II used to travel in the Pope Mobile? Exactly. I've seen the Pope Mobile. Yes. yes. Oh, you've seen the Pope Mobile in person, haven't you? Yes. Okay, so I don't think, well, certainly not this pope, but I don't even think Benedict used it. But it was this little open-backed car with a plastic cover on it. It was like popping fresh pope. And I think you should put the torch in there and just drive it around. And it can be automated, as we've learned. There's all these automated cars. That would be so cheap. Yeah, a self-driving car kind of thing. That's that. You know, maybe one police escort or two, one in front, one in back, and you could just drive that baby around. It would certainly save a lot of time in getting applicants for torch to participate, all those extra torches you need to make, make your torch very valuable to collectors, and so on. Let's make your torch super valuable to collectors and only have a handful of them. We've got ideas. You know what else they need? They need to make like a, a Marianne head. With the logo and like we had the snow flame in Beijing, then you had the Marianne head and like the torch could be the light in her eyes or something. Oh, no. The torch <laughs> is her cigarette. <laughs> so I, I saw on uh, reporter Liam Morgan's Twitter, someone gave him a letter from the IOC to the International Boxing Association. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, boy, oh, boy. So, the IOC is still concerned. They had to reiterate that their recognition of the IBA remains suspended. In terms of Paris 2024 qualification, every other international federation has determined their qualification path to Paris 2024. You have not clearly stated this. And... The the letter that they had, this is a, a whole correspondence thing going back. So this is in response to a letter that the IBA sent to the IOC. Your letter creates the impression that there is significant time to ta available to take the outstanding decisions. However, at this stage, the areas of information specified in our letter of 12th of April should already be clear and confirmed for your national federations and your boxers. Without these details, they face challenges in finalizing their planning of finances, schedules, logistics, and most importantly, training cycles. Therefore, the IOC wishes once more to raise its concerns <laughs> regarding the necessary details of the Paris 2024 boxing qualification system. They also are concerned about the possible selection of events that may not provide fair eligibility criteria, create possible discrimination, they want you to make sure that all boxers had the same level of opportunities to qualify regardless of geographical and or cost factors. 
they still have concerns over the IBA's capacity to execute a complex management system of technical officials management in particular referees and judges and the transparency involved that they should have with this whole management system they are reiterating the request to receive full details of your new ranking system including the calendar this will be paramount for the IOC to assess the effective implementation of the boxing qualification system and again are of vital importance for your boxers and athletes. They noted that the IBA Women's World Champs currently underway. We're still waiting for your updated documents on the referee and judges processes beyond the selection process for this tournament, et cetera, et cetera. We confirm again that the IOC recognition of IBA remains suspended and boxing is not currently included in the program of LA 2028. And we still have concerns. Sincerely, Pakuret Gerard Zappelli, who is the IOC Chief Ethics and Compliance Office, and Kit McConnell, IOC Sports Director. You made my IOC boyfriend mad. I did. And AIBA has the president election they coming do. up next yes. month. And and it, it's we have to get used to not saying IEBA anymore because oh, it now is right. yeah IBA yes and it looks like a a Russian will be elected, which is problematic mm-hmm. because the Russian Boxing Federation was suspended by the IBA because of the invasion of Ukraine. So, we've got so many layers of mess. Right, and I wonder if. The IOC will say once again, hey, organizing committee, you had to put on the boxing tournament too. I wonder if Paris 2024 is not already side-eyeing, side-eyeing that and going, oh, we might have to do this. Let's be prepared. And I'm surprised that the IOC isn't still isn't doing what it is with weightlifting, which is we could still pull you out of 2024. I mean, I've said all along, I think they will waive that threat sooner rather than later. I thought they may have been holding off for the elections to see who was going to get elected. Maybe they didn't want it look like they were influencing the elections. Mm. But this just gets uglier and uglier. On a happier note, though, Mm -hmm. we now have a concerned Tomas Bach. Last week, we had a delighted Tomas Bach. Can somebody come up with some Bach emojis? (laughs) I love it. 70s Tomas Bach. (laughs) The sideburns and the stash. Him in the middle of his orchid. You know, you make flower head Tomas Bach. There's no end of bakmojis. Bakmojis. <laughs> we have a little bit of news about the International Paralympic Committee. Speaking of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. At Beijing 2022, the IPC said it was going to call an extraordinary... General Assembly to discuss whether or not Russia and Belarus's membership in the IPC should be terminated. That extraordinary General Assembly is going to be held in November. I'll be interested to see the outcome of that. Also, the IPC has just launched a big campaign called It Starts With Sport to build awareness, community, and freedom around the Parasport program. And so it's got a film there's a multi-sensory brand identity and they've de- uh, started a dedicated website called para.sport so hopefully this will uh, be a nice focal point for parasport i will say ipc if you would like to build awareness people can come on our show we will happily talk to mr craig or others <laughs> and others talk to many para para people does not matter we would like to build more awareness of parasports because we love them i want to go back to this issue just for a minute about Mm -hmm. the ipc's extraordinary general assembly yes 
So what they are trying to do is to amend their charter to say that if a country breaks the Olympic truce, that's a violation of the charter. And so that would then allow them to suspend the membership of Belarus and Russia. Would also make any sort of things going forward a little easier because the IPC has wanted to slap Russia for a while because of the doping issues. So this is just another thing that keeps getting layered and layered on. And we've talked at length at how the IOC is so afraid to slap Russia and just gives them these very gentle nudges. And the IPC is done. Andrew Parsons is done (laughs) with playing around. He's saying, you are not going to screw up this Paralympic movement when we're getting this momentum, we're building credibility, we're expanding the games, and you are messing it up. And he's had enough. And he's right. I wish the IOC would even consider publicly suspending the membership. And they won't. And they should. So yay, IPC, you are absolutely right. And even if it doesn't pass and even if it doesn't officially happen, the fact that they are even publicly saying this is the direction we want to go in is huge. Yes, I agree with that because the IPC has been the one to say, the the organization who has said, your athletes are banned from various elements with the doping. They went to much more extremes than the IOC did and actually had sanctions that had teeth. So I I appreciate that from the IPC for trying to do the right thing, and hopefully it will make the games more fair and also show the desire to have peace within sport. Right. I think the banning of Russia actually gets you closer to the ideal of let's keep politics out of sport. Because we have Vladimir Putin commenting on the Camilla Valieva case while it is still in litigation and investigation. Yeah. I mean, come on. You can't have the world leader commenting on the case and then expect Rusada, who's I mean, there is nothing in Russia that is not under Vladimir Putin's thumb to then be expected to actually conduct an impartial investigation. You just can't cut all credibility out from underneath this organization. So who's mixing sport and politics here? It's not the IPC. They're doing their best to keep it out. So good on them. I'm, I am, I was impressed when I was there with Andrew Parson and Craig Spence and all the IPC people we met. And I like what they're doing with the organization because it really matters what I think, what they're doing with the organization. (laughs) But I feel like if you're going to build this movement and they are kind of in their childhood still, I feel like we're kind of hitting the teen years, the early Mm -hmm. teen years in terms of development. Let's, let's put our foot down and say, this is the kind of organization we are going to be on the world stage. Very well said. Well, that is going to do it for this week. Let us know what you think of Bobsled and Josh and the fact that he's an official Olympian. It was, I have to say, it was so cool to go to Olymp Media and that's the big database of Olympic statistics and I could search for him now. That was awesome. And you can get in touch with us by email at flamealivepod at gmail.com. Call or text us at 208-352-6348. That's 208-FLAME-IT. Our social handle is at flamealivepod. And be sure to join the Keep the Flame Alive podcast group on Facebook. Join us for more stories of the Olympics and Paralympics next week. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep the flame alive.